Welcome, welcome. Okay, let us just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have drawn us here. Lord, we are not an accident because you perfectly, wonderfully made us. And when you made us in the creation, you said, this is good. So we are good. And Lord, all from the beginning of creation until this very moment, you just want us to have a relationship with us. And Lord, we say just, you have done your bit. And Lord, forgive us how we have fallen away so many times. But Lord, you're such a good God that you said there's no condemnation to those who love me. Lord, you chased us so much, even to die on the cross for us. To say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So Lord, we are here today. We may think by accident. But Lord, we know, or I know, you have brought us by your spirit. And Lord, when you lead us, you lead us into the light. Your Lord, and you give us good things. You're a father who likes to give good things. We as, children, we as parents and grandparents, we know how to give good, good, good gifts to our children and our family. How much more can you, and though we are evil, that you are good, can you give? So Lord, I pray that we can hold on to these promises today. And we can just come and sit at your feet. And maybe just ask that question. Lord, what do you want from me? And then here I am, holy and available. So Heavenly Father, may this time, Lord, be sanctified for you. May we put all our cares and burdens and worries away. And dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So welcome you today. Um, <laughs> We're going to sing a song, it's called Blessed Be Your Name. And this song is taken from the book of Job, chapter 1. I mean, have you heard of, of what happened to Job? He went through a really, really tough time. Lost his family, lost everything, lost his finances, lost his job. And uh, what was his confession? He says, then Job, in Job chapter 1, verse 20, it says, then Job arose, he tore his clothes, he shaved his head, and he fell down upon the ground, and he worshipped. That was his response. When he went through a tough time, he worshipped and he said naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked I will return the Lord gave and the Lord take away blessed be the name of the Lord now we're all going through tough times at the moment with the pandemic with the, the current climate with all the financial problems and everything else so I, I, I believe every single person is going through something tough in this room and was being affected in one way or another by the pandemic but what we're going to do today, we're just going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Anyway, in spite of what is going on out there, we're going to know that God doesn't change. So we're going to continue, like Job, to give our praise and our worship to God. So let's stand and sing, if you would like to. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. 
says about Job. He was a man of great endurance. And we can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. That's what Job is known for, his resilience. And that's what we need in these times. We need some resilience because God said he doesn't change. 
and you can see what God did for Job at the end. So whatever you're going through, mm. focus on God. As hard as it is, and put your trust in him. Don't lean on your own understanding. Mm. Because God has a, an amazing ending for you. God is kind. Yes, God is Lord. merciful. Amen. And God will turn your situation around. Yes, Lord. Amen. Sometimes you think, yeah, but I don't have the strength. Well, that's why we need to spend time in God's presence. Because mm. it says that he gives strength to the weary. Amen. Let's sing, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Mm-hmm. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. God, you reign forever. I hope I strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength for rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. God, you reign forever. I hope I strong deliver. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do. 
Thank you. Take a seat. <coughs> For the people also who are new, I just want to give you some housekeeping. We have toilets at the back of the church. We also have toilets here. And also for creche, I see, uh, I see some babies there, which is lovely. We have a creche back there, and we have toys and things. Please do feel free, again, just to get up and walk. I know sometimes it can be daunting. You're new, oh dear, what do I do? It's okay. Don't worry. Just get up and you can walk. And it's just outside here, and someone will direct you if you look lost. But it's just at the back, back there, and there's toys there you can play. And I'll set the TV up a minute, and also you can see the service there as well. So do feel free if the babies and you want to take them out, that is fine. I thought I think we have a change it, baby changing room as well there as well. Sorry if I'm focused on you, but I'd like to just tell you everything that you need to know. Okay, uh, news and notes today. <coughs> Some of you may have golf. Let's do the activities first. Thank you. The activities this week we have a quiz night. Is it quiz or is it chit chat this week? Phil, do you know? That's what I thought. So every other week, we actually have, every week we have a Zoom night with people on Zoom, and it's either a quiz night or we just have a chit chat. And this week it's a chit chat. So um, if you want to go and come and see me at the end to give you the, uh, the details, and if you're church members, if you want to uh, email me, and, and if you really want to know the, the codes, and we'll let you know. Tuesday focus group is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, activities well. Wednesday is Teddy Bear Club. We're going to be praying later, and some of you will probably, when you hear this, go, oh, poor Sandra has got COVID. Yeah, so she's isolating at the moment. She doesn't know if she'll be available. The good news at the moment, we've got about 75% of people helping. So at the moment, what we're struggling with is probably setting down. That's about 11.45 to about 12.30. If you're available on Wednesday, and you want to just help clear up, that will be fantastic. But at the moment, Sandra, and we're going to be praying for her later on, and she has a few symptoms as well. She's feeling a bit rough, she said. So if you're watching, Sandra, we love you, and we hope you, get, hope you recover quickly. So, yeah, so, again, if you can be there, especially this Wednesday, it would be lovely to have you. And this at 9.45 into 11.45, uh, Teddy Bear Club. Wednesday, 6.30, we have a prayer evening here. So again, please come along. We normally pray at the back and we just pray for what's been going in the world. And it's really good, obviously, to get together. And we know at this church that only prayer changes things. We know that. Nothing else. I tell you, we're not, we're not professionals what we do. And sometimes we wonder what's going on. So please, it's pride prayer only. So please join us at 6.30. Uh, also, some other messages about our missionary. Oh, there we go. Thank you. It's on here. I'm calling it Missionary Sunday now. You may have seen uh, in the news and notes, I don't think it got corrected in, in time, we were going to do some offerings then on the 27th. However, I've spoken to our, and I'll, sorry, let me rewind. We've got Stuart and Carol is in South Africa, working, doing church planting in South Africa, and we've been sub contributing and supporting them for such a long time. And as you know, I think through COVID, uh, people will be struggling, even churches will be struggling. And I got in touch with uh, Stuart and Carol, and in March, they're having uh, one of their supporters can no longer support them. So they're actually in the red. With just their base utilities and things, they're actually in the red. So we, we're quite concerned as a leadership team, and we just thought it'd be really good if we can actually have a... We were going to have a giving Sunday on the 27th. As you've read, we're going to, the next couple of weeks, today and next week, have offerings. There's an offering box there. We don't talk to offerings. If anyone would like to give any money for Stuart and Carol, you can put in the offering box there, and even next week, because we want to send it off as soon as we can. If, again, if you're good with technology, you can actually, and or some of you have signed up stewardship, you can actually put it through stewardship, one, if, one off uh, gift, or you can do it uh, once a month. Just put a reference when it says notes, just put Stuart and Carol missionary. On, but on the 27th, what's not going to change so hopefully by the 27th, we would have sent that love gift to them and with, this, with contributions also with the church regularly give them, or we're going to give them, sorry, a love gift. We, we decide as leadership team. And then also on the 27th, it, as you can see, it's a bring and share lunch. This is a time where it's really nice, but our first one actually this year, where we can actually get together as a fellowship. On the 27th, it's Missionary Sunday, because they're not the only ones we support. There are other missionaries we support, and it would be really nice if we can talk about it a bit more, as much as we can, because there are some missionaries where it's very sensitive. We cannot talk too much in case people watch online, and we've got to be really sensitive because they're, they're working in a place where if people find out, it could be a problem. So, And also we've got a new 
project we're doing in, in, Af in, in uh, Uganda with a school and we get a latest update is what's going on. So it would be really good to a chance to at the end, probably uh, after the service, to talk about what's going on and to pray about it and to eat together. We're calling us here a bring and share. I'm not going to have a rota. <clears throat> I think it's great just to see what happens. I think it's quite fun, actually. I always think it's quite fun, when whatever what we have. If it's all quiches, that's great. If it's all chips, that's great. If it's all Coca-Cola. Whatever it's going to be, don't worry. Uh, and, and again, I know this church has always seemed to bring stuff. And don't worry. Again, we have faith that God will provide. And, and, and again, please bring, bring, if you want to bring desserts, whatever you choose to bring, that is fine. Uh, the next one, we've got Alpha. We haven't got a uh, thing yet yet. Alpha is on the 4th of May. And Alpha, as most of you know, it's a, a really a, a course for basic Christianity where they can ask questions about Christianity in a safe place where sometimes they're not used to the church atmosphere because it's quite scary. And the questions they're scared to ask, where this is a place where any question is safe to ask. And, and actually, something's good because then you're like, oh, I wanted to ask that question. That's happening on the 4th of May. I need a lot of help for this. First of all, I need a lot of people to pray. I need a lot of people to pray for this. Secondly, I need some boldness from some of you to think and ask God, actually, God, who do I invite? Who do I invite? Is it my family, my friends, even my workers, or even some of my enemies? Who knows? Who do I invite? And I pray that God will put that on your heart. God did say love our enemies as well and our neighbors. So uh, please, put that on your heart. The next thing that I would need is food. At the moment, I've got some people helping with food, which is fantastic, but I still need people who are willing. They may say, I will do a food. I want to do it at the old Alpha. Someone's familiar with it, they'll have a cooked meal. I really want to sit down, have a cooked meal, and we can talk. So if you think, yeah, I could do one week, let me know. It's on May the 4th. It runs about 13 weeks. We also need helpers, people who like doing felicitating talk, not being the main talkers, but one basically who helps a conversation flow. And if someone who's got a good maybe character think I can do that, you're not gonna, you don't have to have, have all the answers. If anything, I don't want you to. You're just basically helping the group facilitate and not make sure that one person is not always talking, basically. <laughs> In a nice way, oh, that was nice. Can I hear from you? And we need basically two people in two groups. And I'm thinking at the moment, I actually would like four leaders. So two, two leaders and two helpers would be nice. And then la lastly, what we'd need as well, which you probably know, we would need people, obviously, to clear up. <laughs> the probably like simple thing, maybe coming at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock when we're in there and cleaning up the kitchen, things like that. If that's something that you're interested with, you can email me. You can email me, and if you don't know the email, it's on our website. It should be up and around here. Or you can come and see me at the church and say, put my name down, and then I would do it. But I really need your help. This will not work without you. I did an alpha back a long, long time ago. And I think we had a team of at least 10 people. So I really need a, a strong team there. <clears throat> uh, I think that is it. House groups can be next week. If you're new here, we do have house groups. And they are every other week. And they'll be meeting next week. And I'll tell you more about the dates of house group for next week. And now we go on to celebrations. Birthdays and celebrations. Uh, we've got Tony today. It's his birthday. And, and Simon, you whispered in my ear today. Who else was it today? Whose birthday? Who is it? Sorry, son. Who? Okay, we've got another birthday here. Is anyone else's birthday here? There we go. Yeah, that was it. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. Sorry we didn't have your date to here, so thank you. But happy birthday as well. 21 again. I know. Thank you. And is there, yeah, is there any celebrations we've got? Is there anything that anybody wants to give thanks to God for this week? Yes. Oh yes, oh yes, we're having a baby boy. So yes, we just found out, thank you. And again, we want to, actually we all do want to give thanks for that. Everything is healthy. There's no scatter. So we had this scan, went through the whole check, so everything is all going well. And, and just to embarrass her, that's my wife over there, sorry. <laughs> With the bump, so yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so yes, we give God thanks for that. Any other? Yes. Your daughter's going to be 50. Wow. Wow, and I bet you can't probably wrap around your head, can you? Probably still thinking nappies, yes. I can't imagine when I'm saying they're 50, yes. Wow, 50 years old. Very young, 50. I say that because I was 50 a couple of weeks ago, so yeah, very, very young. Anything else, or we just give thanks to God? Okay, let's give thanks. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all these activities. But Heavenly Father, we don't want to just call them activities. We want to call them bridges to your heart. So Heavenly Father, all the things that we've talked about, all the missionaries that we support and contribute, Lord, I pray where they are right now that you will sustain them. You will give them the provincial needs they need. You will give them the rest they need. Because Lord, sometimes missionaries, Lord, they give so much. You will give them the friendship they need around them. And give them the, the spiritual support that they may need as well to grow. As they are giving, may they have places, Lord, where they can grow. And Lord, particularly at the moment, we do pray for Stuart and Carol. Lord, you know their situation. And Lord, we just pray that you will provide. And Heavenly Father, if that is through us, speak to us. But Lord, you said that you, you, you want a cheerful giver. So Heavenly Father, may anything that we feel from you, that we do it cheerfully. I don't want, Lord, we do it, Lord, with a heart that we think we have to do it. So I pray, Lord, for this church as well, for our finances. Help us to know how much to, su to supply to our missionaries. And how much do we need also to prepare for what's coming ahead? So give us wisdom when it comes to our finances as, as individuals and as a church. And Lord, we lift up Alpha to you. We thank you already for the people who are going to come. We thank you, Lord, that you are going to be calling them. And we pray that you wake them up. Wake up their slumber right now, their spiritual death. Wake them up. And Lord, that may be through us. You call us, you say, we are the light in their darkness. Lord, it may be us at work to say, come to Alpha. And that may be our first time we've ever stepped out. So Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you'll put people on our minds right now. And maybe even shock us because your way is not our way. It may be a family member we think, no way, no way could they believe. But Heavenly Father, we, read and we see and read in the Bible, no way could you have done that. But you did. And for some of us sitting here, who would have thought every Sunday when people are watching their football or having their sleepings we are here dedicating our time who would have thought for 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years who would have thought if you can change our heart how many more can you change and Lord we pray also for the helpers and the leaders Lord we pray that you will call them again they will have a cheerful heart That's, that doing your work is not a burden we know it's a blessing working for your kingdom. So Lord, we pray again for your Holy Spirit. Because there's no condemnation, no guilt. Your Holy Spirit to call. And we lift up also finally the, the chit chat. And we lift up also the, the focus group. Thank you Lord for places where we can go and talk. And get to know people more in this church. We pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. If there's anything I ever do forget as they're coming up, do let me know. We can put it in our news and notes. But there is a, if you want to also be on our mailing list, we, have, we give out notices after this service. We normally give notices what we've been set up here as well. So if you want to be on our mailing list, do let us know. Thank you. Okay, we'll come to um, matters for prayer. So before we bring our shopping list to God, because that's what we normally do, is there any answers to prayer? I just want to ask. Because we've been praying for things over the weeks. Has anyone got any answers to prayer? Maybe you said already in the celebrations, but has anyone, anything happened that you prayed and got answered? Because God does answer prayer. I didn't, I didn't prepare you for this, but my daughter's got an answer to prayer, haven't you? Um, she hasn't been well for the last couple of weeks. Had a really, really bad cough, not COVID, thankfully. Um, and then you complained of having your ears blocked. Remember, was it both of them or one of them? Yeah, so we prayed, didn't we, last night, and what happened? My ear, the right ear stopped hurting and then the left ear unblocked in the morning. So the right ear stopped hurting and the left ear unblocked. So we just want to give God thanks for that. So God does answer prayer. Any other answers to prayer? Anyone? He came home from hospital either on Friday or Saturday. And he is having four carers Day. About a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, we prayed with Aaron about my son because he was doing the exam. 
Uh, he finished the exam and he got passed out so he thanked God for that. Anyone else? So Mark tested positive for COVID on Wednesday, so we all had a little panic in the household. Um, thankfully, we've all been negative all week, and Mark tested negative last night, so he's all clear, and we're all clear, and no one else got it, so that's brilliant. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, this morning when I was preparing, I'm just going to illustrate this. The scripture says, cast your burdens onto the Lord because he cares for you. What's a burden? A burden is a heavy weight that's on your back. And so what happens, what that means is like, so you're weighed down by whatever it is you're, that is troubling you. It could be COVID, it could be uh, the sickness, it could be uh, finances. And what costing your care means is take off the burden, go to the feet of the Lord Jesus and leave that burden at his feet. Does that mean that the answer comes straight away? No. But what does it mean? It means that you've given the anxiety over to the Lord. And that's what makes you free to worship him. When you take your heavy burdens and you give it to the Lord Jesus Christ, it says because he cares for you. So you can rest assured that when you give that situation to him, he cares for you. My daughter was worried about her ears, but we, we prayed and we laid that thing down at the feet of Jesus Christ. When she woke up in the morning, ears were opened. Does he want to come straight away? No, there's things that I'm still waiting for for years. But I'm still I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to trust God. Okay? So on that note, is there anything that we, anybody would like prayer for today? Yes, Brother. Uh, I'm going to ask the people that come to the prayer meeting, the prayer... Yeah, sure, of course you can, yeah. Um, and also, um, you saying that um, Mark, uh, Sandra's got COVID as well, so we'll pray for that. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So... I'm, done. I'm going to pick on the people that come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday. Everybody should be a prayer warrior, but I'm going to pick on Dave, Mariam, and Satya. Where's Satya? Is she at the back? There. So, Satya, um, Mary, can you pray for all the COVID situations? Uh, David, can you pray for Derek? Anything else? Anybody else want to pray for anything else? Put your hand up if you just want, I do, if you just want prayer for yourself. Just, you, you don't have to say what it is, but if you want prayer, just lift up your hand now. I, I'll put my hand up. <laughs> I need prayer. Yeah? So, Satya and the prayer warriors, if you see the people got their hands up, if you could pray for them, please. So I'll, I'll give the microphone to David and Mary. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. For you are the God who heals. You are Jehovah Rebekah. Father God, we lift up Derek before your throne of grace. We thank you for his life, Lord. And Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you touch. He's feeling weak and he's feeling low. Father, you strengthen, strengthen his, strengthen his frame, strengthen, put, strengthen his spirit, Lord, that he, in spite of everything, he may praise you, Lord. And his treatment will be timely when they say it's going to be. Father, in Jesus' name, encourage him. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, we love you, Father, because you first loved us. We worship you, Jesus, because you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you laid down your life for us because you love us so much. Father God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your only Son. So how much more would you not give us whatever we need, Father, we thank you. We lift up our sister Sandra before your throne of grace, oh God. We thank you that you are the God that heals, oh God. We thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes she is healed. Father God, we plead that you stretch forth your hands and grant her healing. Heal her, oh God, in Jesus' name. Strengthen her, Father God. Strengthen her faith in you. Strengthen her love for you, oh God. Even her whole family. Protect 
Father God, I give you the honor, praise, and the glory into your name. You are God. You are the I am that I am from the beginning of time to the end of time. There's nothing that you cannot do for your children. You said you are the God the same yesterday, today, and forever. I never fail in God. <coughs> your word said trust in you. Lord, we come in your word, Father God. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that need help in this church. Whatever they need are financially, physically, mentally, spiritually, because you are able, you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name for your children, that when they cry out about Father, that you will hear and answer their prayer, because you are our Father. And Father, hear our prayer this morning, and touch each and every one in the missionary father wherever they are whoever they are and they're calling on you your children are calling on you father so i pray in jesus name and i bless them father god that you will meet all their needs whatever it is lord and i ask it in jesus name and i say thank you and amen, and amen. yes father anybody who has covid lord in this church lord god or even not in this church, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your protection, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, you said that we, you will take us through it, Lord God. Thank you for um, the testimony of people who have recovered, Lord God. And I thank you that they will recover, Lord God. So every single person that has been uh, tested positive for COVID, we thank you, Lord, that COVID is not greater than the name of Jesus and that you will take them through and the symptoms will not be um, <clears throat> serious, Lord God, but they will be mild, Lord God, and that they will recover quickly. In Jesus' name, Lord God. Jesus name just a, as Paul said, said just a quick plug for the prayer meeting prayer changes things why because we're putting our faith in God who changes things okay so I just want to encourage you every Wednesday 6 30 even if you can only come once a month try and come to the church prayer meeting at 6 30 you will grow as a prayer warrior as you can say the people that I ask to pray they pray regularly that's why I ask them to pray but all of us need to be prayer warriors prayer warriors not warriors not as a warrior as an anxiety but a warrior. <laughs> so as the children go out for Sunday school, we're just going to have a, uh, two more songs and then Grandma's going to, oh, yeah, and possibly something. Yeah. I, I did say I'd pray. I got, again, thank God for the internet. I don't know if anyone uh, watched our YouTube service. Uh, someone commented, I don't know who they were, and they said it would come today. And don't worry if you're not here today. And uh, today would have been his 10th year that their son Daniel would have died. And he said he would just like us to pray. So his name is Stephen. So Stephen, this is for you today, that we want to ask that God's peace will come upon you. We thank you, Lord, for Daniel. We thank you, however short that time was, that we thank you that children are a gift. But Heavenly Father, we also pray that when we are mourning, you come close. You said that when we are lowly, you will lift us up. So Heavenly Father, with that family, and whoever else is involved in this remembrance today of 10 years, Lord, may you be close to them in a way that they do not know. May you give them peace, that really there should be no peace right now, maybe anxiety and frustration and anger. But Lord, you say in the word that you give peace past all understanding. So Lord, I pray in all their understanding and their, maybe their loss and their grief, that in there, when they call out to you, as they called out and they ask for prayer, that by your Holy Spirit right now, that you will touch them and give them peace and speak the words that they need to hear. Comfort them how they need to be comforted. And again, we thank you, Lord, for that life of Daniel. We thank you, Lord, how you have given that gift to them. And Lord, may you bless them right now as they are mourning. In Jesus' name, amen. Children like to go out and, and we just pray for the Sunday school teachers. Thank you very much. May you be blessed today. I think it's Mary today. Bless you, Mary, today. Christ alone, the cornerstone. So we're going to sing that song now. And when you're going through tough times, the firm foundation is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone of our faith. He is the cornerstone of our life. And as we keep focusing on him, 
God will take us through every situation, every circumstance. So please stand if you'd like to, or if you want to sit, that is fine too. I did not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love and through.
He is my refuge, he is my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers and under his wings I shall trust. I will not be afraid of the terror that comes by night or for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness. For he shall give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. They will bear me up in their hands lest I dash my foot against a stone. And I want to focus on verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. And yes, I will Lord. set him on high Amen. because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Mm. I will be with him. I will be with her in trouble. And I will deliver them and I will honor them. Mm. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Mm. Verse 14 says, because he has set his love upon me. Mm. And that's the challenge for us to continue to set our love upon God. Mm. Despite the circumstances, no matter what we're going through. And as God gives us strength to continually set our love upon him. Mm. Um, Granville's going to be talking about... Um, the church that lost its first love and i pray that that's not us we're not or that's not you that you haven't forgotten your first love which is jesus christ mm. and as my wife sings this next song we will join her in the second time we sing it we're going to sing draw me close to you never let me go i lay it all down again to hear you say that i'm your friend
Father, you draw us near to worship. You draw us near also to your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. To dear Heavenly Fathers, we come now to listen to your word for your servant. Lord, I pray that you will be with Granville. All these preparations that he has done, been led by you. Lord, may we have an ear to hear. Lord, a heart to almost comprehend and feet to do be the action. So Lord, be with Granville now, we pray. Amen. So the the, uh, the message of um, chapters two and three of uh, the book of uh, Revelation is to uh, the seven first century churches in what is today modern day Turkey, but what in those days was known as Asia Minor. <clears throat> but to start with, a little bit of background. The author is John the brother of James and one of Jesus' inner circle of three disciples he had while on earth. John also wrote the fourth gospel. But I'm a bit reticent to call him the author as it quickly became apparent that from the start either Jesus or the Holy Spirit is the source of the content of this book. John is more or less an observer or a listener who logs down what he's told or what he's seen. Most commentators agree that the book was written in the latter part of the first century by now elderly John, who was exiled to an island not too far away from Turkey called Patmos. Now years ago, I thought that John was kept on this island for the rest of his life. Uh, but it looks like he might only have been exiled to Patmos for about 18 months. And it was during this time that he produced the book of Revelation. Uh, after that, it's generally believed that he went to, he returned to Ephesus. And it's to Ephesus we will go in in a moment. But first, I need to say something else. And that is that I'm wondering if this series should have been eight weeks long, not seven because the vision of the risen awesome Jesus in chapter 1 is integral to aspects of the content of the message Jesus gave to these seven churches. But hopefully that will come out as we hear what he's got to say. And with that, let's read Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. And I'll be using uh, the NIV translation. Incidentally, if you ever want to use a church Bible, the trolley at the back there has got a load on them. And today, this uh, passage is on page 1234 in the church Bibles. So, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands I know your deeds your hard work and your perseverance I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary yet I hold this against you you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, 
I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And immediately, I have a problem. Jesus self-identifies himself as him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. But that's straight out of chapter 1, where we find it's part of the image John sees of the risen Christ. And as it's a vision, it's a bit like a dream where things are not always literally as you see them. So there are symbols. But also, in chapter 1, John conveni uh, Jesus conveniently explains the meaning to John. He tells him that seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and he's about to send me and that he's about to send the messengers too. And the lampstands represent the seven churches themselves, presumably because they're intended to be a means of holding Jesus' light in the uh, dark surroundings they live in, a bit like. South Rysett Christian Fellowship is intended to be a lamp standing South Rysett for God's light to shine out from us here. You get the picture. Let me just interrupt myself for a moment. When you read the Bible, you need to consider what you're reading in context. Be that the context of surrounding chapters or the context of the history behind the content. So the context here is the risen, exalted Jesus ruling and reigning in his church. He's not only Lord of eternity, but Lord over his church on earth as well as the angels in heaven. But the context is also the situations pertaining to the locations of each of these seven churches that he's writing to. My remit today is just to talk about the first century church at Ephesus but I anticipate my fellow speakers will fill you in in the coming days with the circumstances surrounding the uh, other six churches as we go through the series. Side over. Now let's look at the risen Jesus message to the church at Ephesus. But we'll first need to look at the city of Ephesus and at the first century church in that city as the recipient of Jesus' message. Today, Ephesus is a historical site. Give you some idea of the place. This is the ruins of uh, Ephesus's library. The history of Ephesus goes back a long way, and its location moves slightly down the years. But the ruins you can see today are from the Roman period, so date to the New Testament times. It was a port city although with the silty up of the sea, uh, uh, sorry, silty, silty up of the river that uh, it was situated on, the sea is now some six miles away. And it was a key administrative centre of the Roman province of Asia. So think of it as the local area as London, and you get a feel for its importance. Religion-wise, it had two main strains. The first was the goddess Artemis, also known as Diana. And uh, if you read the book of Acts and Paul's missionary journeys, that name will be familiar to you. As there was a riot in Ephesus directly caused by Paul's introduction of Christianity to the city, being instrumental in ruining the trade in civil, silver <laughs> idols, just as the one shown. The other strain was emperor worship. Interestingly, the practice of um, worshipping living em emperors happened in the provinces, but not in Rome itself. But seeing as Ephesus was a, a, a provincial capital, it was here that uh, there was the, the Roman imperial cult. We know from inform information external to the Bible 
that Ephesus was known as the temple warden for two Ephesian temples dedicated to the imperial cult, as well as temple warden to the goddess Artemis. So that's how big these idolatrous influences were in Ephesus. And both of these in-your-face aspects of Ephesus society are background to problems faced by the Christians in Ephesus in this period, but more of that later. Now we don't know if there were any visitors from Ephesus in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost that were able to take back home what happened then. But we do know that the message of Jesus' salvation did come to Ephesus with Paul's preaching in AD 52. In fact, Paul spent three years teaching and preaching in Ephesus, which for him seems a long time. He was aided by Aquila and Priscilla, who were then aided by Apollos. And after Paul left, he appointed his protege, Timothy, to continue his work. Add to that that we know that John, same John of the book of Revelation, spent time at Ephesus, and you now know that some of the big guns of early Christianity were associated with this local church. Or perhaps that should be churches, as it's thought they may have been a group of house churches working together. So perhaps it's not so strange that Jesus commences his message to them with this commendation. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. So any false teaching anyone attempted to introduce into this assembly of Christians would have been treated like a germ dreamt into a bottle of bleach. I'll be asking a question related to that in a moment. But first, I want to draw your attention to two words. I know. And you'll be hearing them again and again and again every week of this seven-week series. As Jesus starts his evaluation of each of and every one of these churches with them. If you were... Um, living in China today you'd be living in one of the most surveillance sensitive countries on the planet modern electronic technology has been increasingly used to monitor the whole population to an extreme degree face recognition in public spaces and communication monitoring are used by a regime intent on knowing exactly what you're doing and who you're doing it with and I read somewhere they even wanted to install face recognition in equipment inside churches. Those they haven't shut down, that is. But when Jesus says, I know, he doesn't need any of these sorts of means. If I had time, I'd like to read the whole of Psalm 139 to you. Slowly. But just to give you a flavour... The author says this about God. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. And you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And that's the platform on which the messages to these seven churches stands because our all-knowing God says time and time and time again, I know And the first thing he wants these Christians to know is he's aware of their tenacity on, in holding on to the truth and gives error no room to breed. So I now need to ask the question, how well equipped are we to be able to receive the same commendation 
from Jesus in 21st century South Reislip. Of course, <clears throat> we haven't got Timothy or Aquila and Priscilla living just around the corner to inquire of. And uh, Paul and John aren't uh, mere te text message away. But nevertheless, we are blessed because we have the Bible in our own language in many translations and paraphrases. And we've had centuries of people who've worked at understanding his message to help us if, if efficiently uh, get into its content. And that's because in previous generations, people have given up their lives to make that possible. We are blessed. So some more questions. First, how much do you value the Bible we have, you have? And then, how well do you know it? And also, how well can you use it as a weapon against falsehood? If you want to know what I mean by that, think back to when I was talking about the armor of God from Ephesians. Ephesians, interesting, a letter Paul wrote to Ephesus where he called uh, the sword of the spirit the word of God. Let's be specific. There are some street preachers who were recently arrested for teaching from the Bible that homosexuality is not right according to God's way of thinking. Are they right? Or are they misrepresenting God? Is the society norm around us correct? Or is it not right? And Christians need to have an answer to such things that they can rely on. Because it's not just down to our opinion. Not even the teaching of a particular church denomination. But right because it's what God says about it. Or what about divorce? What does God say about that? Or come to that, relationships in general, be that marriage, work, church, family. Or what about prosperity theology? The idea that says fundamentally that if you scratch God's back, he'll scratch yours. And forgets the hundreds upon hundreds of our brothers and sisters who today aren't becoming prosperous as a reward for their faithfulness but are being killed for it. So the question really is, how well do you know the Christian Disciples Handbook, the Bible? And I know I've said this sort of thing before, but I'm not apologizing because it's such an important part of living the Christian lifestyle. And we live in a country where we have so many aids to understanding the Bible. From various uh, day daily Bible reading notes to more in-depth uh, study commentaries and we live in a country where only one won't get you thrown into prison which you can't say for everywhere in the world before I move on another word of commendation from Jesus for this local church at Ephesus he commends them for their perseverance. You see, the Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. We're called to be spiritual Mo Farahs, not Usain Bolts. Don't believe me? Hear what Hebrews 12 has to say. Therefore, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Discipleship is a lifelong event. And then Jesus tells the Ephesians that they have something else in their favor. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as he did. Hate is a very strong word, and here it's Jesus who's using it. 
Some have said that it means that he finds them utterly repulsive. So the question must be, who were these Nicolaitans and what were their deeds? We can thank the writings of uh, two of the early uh, church leaders for the little information we know about them. It appears the name comes from uh, being followers of a man called Nicholas of Antioch, who was actually one of the first seven church deacons mentioned in Acts uh, chapter 6 and verse 5, <coughs> but obviously later went off on his own, went off on his own way. <coughs> Acts 6 5 tells us that he was a convert to Judaism. So he started out in paganism, converted to Judaism, and then to Christianity which might actually be material to the heresy that now bore his name. Because basically it was a belief that you could intermingle different religions together and there was nothing unique or separate, in other words holy, about believing in Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> which in the local context of Ephesus meant you could participate in the practices of the worship of Diana, act, associate with the activities uh, uh, to do with the worship of the emperor, and also break bread and drink wine every Sunday to celebrate Jesus. It was a belief system of compromise. and Within the add-ons brought in by this belief system was not only idolatry, but also immorality which is why some people uh, couple this error to Jesus' message to the church at Pergamon, which we'll be looking at in two weeks' time, where the teaching of Balaam from the Old Testament is mentioned. But the fact is, all these compromises destroy the faithful discipleship we're called to live. So bringing it up to date, what Nicolaitan influences have we bought into in our 21st century Christianity? Not now from this man's deviation from the truth, but from the multitude of influences in the society around us. Let me make a few suggestions of possibilities. And let's start with thinking broad, because the real reason behind the Nicolaitan deviation was a desire to fit in so what in your lifestyle has more to do with fitting in at work or at home with others accepted, uh, accepted norms uh, than with Jesus' prescriptions? That uh, could be sexual stuff. The ideas and practices that our society now deems okay that if you ran them past Jesus would be considered compromises with purity. purity. Or maybe it could be nearer the deviations of uh, uh, the church at Ephesus than we'd care to admit. Acceptance of cult practices or the influence of the stars. Or is it maybe the magnetic draw of materialism and its envious grip on the fallen human nature? But it could actually be just about anything we've slipped into doing down the years that compromises our obedience to Christ. And if you overlay the principles of faithfulness to God that we find in the Bible, it wouldn't show up so well. So maybe it's back to knowing the Bible again as our framework for living. And if you think, but we're not likely to be tripped by such things, think again. When I was very, very much younger, I got involved with a Christian telephone ministry in Harrow. I'd actually felt something in my spirit, sort of disquiet at the time, but being much younger and perhaps more humble than I am now, I thought the problem was me not being spiritual enough as I was around all these super Christians. Until it came out that the guy running the show was encouraging people in the group to sleep around in trial marriages. I need uh, to leave you to ponder the personal implications of these thoughts uh, sometime later because I, I now need to move on to look at Jesus' words to this church where he says, 
yet I hold this against you. If you were the first listeners to this message being read up to now, you might have been patting yourselves on the back and uh, on the quality of your discipleship. But hearing Jesus say this would have burst your bubble. For Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Oops. But we need to ask, what is Jesus talking about? What did he mean by, you've lost your first love? So now, I've got a little work for you. What I'd like you to do is get into small groups or just with the people close to you for no more than two or three minutes. I mean no more than two, two or three minutes and see if you can answer that question. And uh, then we'll come back and see what answers we got. So very quickly, two or three minutes, you're on the clock. See if you can answer that question. So I'm wondering what answers you came up with. Now, if you sing out some answers to me, I'll repeat them in the mic. Anybody? The zeal you had. The zeal you had. Tell other people and not care about your lifestyle was now more holy. And if it were laughing, you didn't care because you were doing it. You've been reading my notes, haven't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Um, commentators actually take two views on what Jesus was talking about here. But rather than take an either-or approach, I'm going to treat it as both and, and say that Jesus could have been concerned both about their love for each other and their love for him and his call on their lives. <clears throat> on at least um, one occasion while Jesus walked the earth, he said something like, Take note of everything the Pharisees teach you but don't live the way they do. And he accused the Pharisees of telling people what they should do, but not living a, lifting a finger to help them do it. <clears throat> the Pharisees as a movement started out as a, a group of God-fearing Jews seeking to serve God, uh, serve God the best way they could. But by Jesus' time, they become a legalistic, become legalistically precise, and humanly cold, as well as being coming proud and deceitful, but that's another story. <clears throat> and one way Jesus could have been demolishing the late first uh, century disciples of the Church of Ephesus was for getting into the same cold hearted mindset. So that begs the question how warm is our affection for each other in the church? Perhaps we could ask, how costly is it? because that might be a measurable answer. Or maybe another way of asking the question is to ask, how practical is it? Do you remember the answer Jesus gave to the question about the most important commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Of course, Jesus told at least one parable pointing to the fact that your neighbour is more than just your brother and sister in the church. So we look at uh, specific teachings in various New Testament letters to flesh out uh, the detailed applications, some detailed applications of the Bible. But the answer Jesus gave about the greatest commandment does bring us nicely on to the other thread of thinking about what he meant when he said to, the, to this church at Ephesus, you've lost your first love. They didn't love him like they did when they first believed in him. Now, Nikki was here earlier, wasn't she? She's gone outside. Yeah, okay. I was going to get Nikki to come up to the platform and talk about Arsenal. Sorry, for the uninitiated, Arsenal's a football team. Um, the trouble is, I probably have trouble 
get here to go back and sit down again. And the reason I had that problem levering off the platform is that she would be animated with a passion about her favourite football team. You see, while it's not good translation, if Jesus said, yet I hold this against you, you've lost the passion you used to have. It could work as a reasonable paraphrase. Not, of course, that the Ephesians had lost their passion for the periphery things of Christianity, because Jesus already complimented them on that, but they'd lost their passion for him, because Christianity is based on a relationship, not on a rule book. And so serious did Jesus take this charge, uh, change in them, he said, consider how far you've fallen and repent. That's the same word used when we first came to believe in him. In other words, turn round and go in the opposite direction. And he even added the dire consequences that if they don't, their church will cease to exist. That's the meaning of removing the lampstand. I wonder how this uh, loss of their first love was being seen in their lives. One suggestion is that it was a loss of a clear witness in their lives. They'd lost their zeal to tell others about Jesus and what he'd done for them. And if you want to know what that sort of witness looks like, just think back to last week and Samuel's testimony about what God had done for him. And I wouldn't, don't need really to say too much more. But that doesn't mean you've got to have the same sort of testimony as Samuel. Mine is nothing like, my experience of God is nothing like Samuel's. But it's just as real. And the loss of a clear witness is what God, of what God had done for the Ephesians fits with the threat of removing the lampstand. Because it was supposed to hold out the light of the world at, to others. And if it wasn't, what was it the purpose of being there? Back to the idea of supporting a football team. And if you're enthusiastic, you share that enthusiasm. So maybe enthusiasm, enthusiasm for sharing Jesus could be a, a sort of paraphrase as well that they'd lost today Ephesus is just a historic site uh, but in the couple of centuries uh, following the writing down of the, this letter it remained a powerful Christian witness and it gave martyrs to Christian history. So we may presume they took note. But what about us in 21st century South Rising? What are we supposed to take away from this message for us today? And how do you show a genuine passion for Jesus today? Is it, for instance, making a lot of noise in church with our style of worship? Is that the sort of passion for Jesus he says is missing? I'd say not. It goes much deeper. One man I know of who walked the walk of loving Jesus was a young American called David Wilkinson. He saw the news of a criminal trial being held in New York in 1958 of seven members of a street gang. He felt the Holy Spirit lead him to up sticks from a church in Pennsylvania and go to New York to tell the drug addicts and gang members about Jesus. One day, one of the gang members said to him, I could cut you into little pieces. To which David Wilkinson replied, Yes. And every piece would say, I love you. And that's something else about the love that Jesus found this church in Ephesus had lost. It wasn't a, a quantity matter. It was a quality issue. 
So where do we get this quality of love? Because one thing's for sure, what we can't do is produce it by our own willpower. If you go to John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 15, you'll find it says this. If you love me, keep my commands. Or as I heard God say distinctly to me one morning on the tube going to work, all I ask is that you do what I tell you. But the verse goes on to say, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Actually, that's a bit of a chicken and egg statement, because we can't love or obey without the help of God the Holy Spirit being with us and within us. But what God wants from us is a willingness to be available to be filled with him so that he is then able to help us to live the life that we should as his children. And that's the same for us as it was for those first century Ephesian Christians. So in conclusion, please let us love as we should both God with passionate obedience and those around us with genuine loving affection. Amen. Thank you very much, Granville. Uh, very challenging. I think the question we've got to ask when it comes to about repentance, it may be come to, have we lost the belief in what we're reading? or what we're not reading. I think if we knew the love of God and the righteousness of God and where we're going or where we're not, where some are not going, if we believe God is the creator of heaven and earth and we have heard, obviously, we haven't heard him for a long time actually, where if you don't believe in Christ, you know where you're going. Oh, no, that's not very nice. We don't want to tell people that anymore. And if we're not careful, we actually get quite soft into, oh, is there really a hell? And then we kind of change our doctrine and we kind of get, and then we ourselves lose that urgency sometimes to tell people. I know some people yourself, I'm not talking about me as well. I've, I've seen two different funerals now and, two, and feelings of funerals. Belie people who believe and people who don't. And I've seen it where people don't know where they're going. I see the confusion, the pain, the anger. And then I've seen where Christians can say, we're having a celebration. And the joy, yes, you're mourning, but the joy of, we're going to see them one day. I know I've lost that in my heart, that our friends and family, we will not see no more. We've lost that. And I think we even need, even I need to ask God for that in our hearts again. I think we've kind of a bit loose in our love of God wouldn't do that, would he? No, we do that to ourselves or they do that to themselves. And we've got to see that again. And I've got to see, even I've got to see that again, that our loved ones who are not saved will not be with us. As my wife said when her mother-in-law got saved the week before she passed, she said, and it was so great and I always remember this, if it wasn't for knowing that one day we were resurrected and seeing my mother again, I could have not gone through that pain and anguish. What kept me going was the faith and the reassurance that I will see my mother one day, no more tears, a new body, and living together forever. And that's when we can say, Amen. So may we have that joy in our heart and may we ask the Lord even where we are today and thank you again Granville that with things that we read let us start believing that again and let the urgency of our belief be then the passion to then obviously just tell because if we had that urgency of knowing where they were going some of them or the urgency the other way and I know people have done it in this congregation where there's no hope and you just say to somebody Jesus loves you and you see them weep there are people out there who have got no hope at all. 
No hope. And we have that hope. And it could be simple as, Jesus loves you. You are perfectly, wonderfully made. And he wants a relationship with you. I wish I could be more passionate like that when I saw people mourning. What is the worst thing that can happen to us, church? They laugh at us. But what's the best thing that can happen to us or to them? They find the Lord Jesus Christ and they find salvation. Dear Lord, forgive us. We have strayed. This church should be full. Forgive us, Lord. And may you give us that fire in our bellies again. Knowing what we have got, that gift of salvation. Help us, Heavenly Father, to have that passion again. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're now going to prepare for communion. The, the song we're going to sing to prepare our hearts for communion. Getting this love back again. Please remember there's no condemnation belong to Christ. You just surrender and repent. We're going to be singing before uh, we, as we start communion. What kind of love is this? If you are a visitor here, I just want to tell you how we take communion here. If you've turned from your sins and you believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, not by works, but his salvation, Jesus invites you to come to this table, to share in this communion, in remembrance of the act what he did for you and I. If you're unsure and that's really about unsure if you know who you are in Christ and you've not worked it out yet please feel free when the bread and the wine comes to pass it by but even right now at your table or your chair if there's words you've held today and the first love you don't understand that first love you can simply confess your sins to Christ now 
and he will forgive you. There is no time limit. There is no course. Confess your sins to Jesus. Call on the name of Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Even if you did that today in your seat and you thought, yes, I wasn't a believer, but I want to believe in Christ. I believe Christ died for me on the cross for my sins. I am a sinful person. But Jesus died, and when he said, Father, forgive them, that was for me. They don't know what they're doing. And then he conquered death by resurrecting on the third day. If you believe in that, simply confess your sins today, and you can take communion. That is how simple it is today. And for Christians who are here, and I know I've been there sometimes, very hard, you may have had a hard week, and you know, I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy to take this. None of us. So when you start saying I'm not worthy, you're doing the worst thing possible and almost saying, Christ never died for me. I'll do it when I'm better. We're all sick people. We all, we're all fallen by grace. We're not by works. So if that's you, just repent of your sins. If there's something stirring, you say, I don't feel worthy, what the Holy Spirit is prompting you is saying, repent, turn away from your sins and come. So now we're going to say a communion prayer. It should be up on the board. And we say it's together. And this could be for some of you the first time, even people who are going to watch later on. You may want to say this prayer. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, I bow before you in humility and ask that you examine my heart today. Show me anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion, any unconfessed sin that may be hindering my relationship with you. Let's pause there. I know, I know that I am your beloved child having received you into my heart and life and having accept your death as a penalty for my sins, sin, sin, sinfulness. The price you paid and covered for me all the time and my desire is to live for you. Scripture tells us in 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said to them, to the disciples, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat of this flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats this flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat this, that Christ died for you, and feed on him in heartly faith with thanksgiving. When this goes around, you can, you can take it your own time, okay? Thank you.
The blood of Christ that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. The last concluding hymn we'll be now singing will be, I stand amazed in his presence.
how marvellous is your love for me. Lord, may we truly know that in our hearts so it will naturally, organically overspill to the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just got, if you'd like to sit down. Just got a message for our bellies. There's some birthday cake if you want to stay behind. We've got some birthday cake to, to celebrate Marlies. Is it Marlies? Got Marlies here. Oh, sorry. Marion, sorry, got Marlies. Yes, I thought, I thought. Marlies? Oh, sorry, forgive me. Don't worry. Marlies, say yes. So some birthday cake is there. And may you have your daughter as well. Have a lovely birthday as well today. Bless you. Have a wonderful week. And if you can stay around for cake, good. But if you don't, I'll eat the rest of it. Thank you.